Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Trino here. Today's line of evidence for evolution is phylogeny, which, simply put, is the grouping of organisms together by their relationship into a family tree, or web in the case of organisms capable of horizontal gene transfer. Technically, when your fourth grader makes a family tree for a school project, they are constructing a phylogeny. But how can the construction of a phylogeny be used as evidence for evolution when it relies on the assumption of relatedness? Well, let's find out. Most phylogenies are hypotheses. That is, they are the proposed explanation for a narrow set of phenomena, the phenomena in this case being the appearance of relatedness. The reason most phylogenies remain hypotheses rather than becoming fact is because evolution is a messy process. There are often more than one phylogeny that can explain the appearance of relatedness, and most phylogenies deal with common ancestors that would have gone extinct a long, long time ago, long enough that their genetic material would not be preserved. And without genetic testing to verify it, it is entirely possible that a structure that appears to be homologous could actually be analogous instead, being the result of convergent evolution. And in more distantly related organisms, even genetic testing is not perfect. So phylogenies must be analyzed with several processes, the most common of which is known as parsimony analysis. Parsimony is a principle that is similar to Occam's razor. When there are multiple explanations for a phenomena, the one that relies on the fewest added assumptions is preferred. So if you're looking at four taxa, that is a taxonomic group of any rank, so it could be species, order, family, phyla, and the like. So if you have four taxa, A, B, C, and D, then with respect to taxon A, there are three potential phylogenies. That is, it could be most closely related to B, most closely related to C, or most closely related to D. Parsimony analysis would examine all four taxa and determine which structure of relatedness is most likely based on the different criteria depending on what data you're working with. For instance, genetic data will be looking at, you guessed it, DNA, whereas fossil data would be looking at morphology. So when looking at our four taxa, you could arrange them in three ways, in three phylogenies. To oversimplify it, the analysis looks at which of the phylogenies results in taxon A having the most in common with whichever taxon is closest to it in that phylogeny, and this one will be the one proposed as the most parsimonious. Sometimes this can be relatively easy with morphology. There has never been an instance of anything analogous to the spine convergently evolving, so we know that if an organism has a spine, it fits into the vertebrata clade. Sometimes, though, it can be a bit more tricky. The clade Uniconta consists of organisms whose flagellated cells have one singular flagellum. But it would be entirely reasonable to think that it's possible that an organism which has multiple flagella could evolve in such a way as to lose all but one flagellum, meaning that a biconta, an organism with two flagella, could potentially evolve into an organism that we would have no way of knowing just by looking at morphology does not belong in Uniconta. This is why we have to look at character analysis. The phylogeny that involves the fewest number of character changes is most likely to be the correct one. So complex and in-depth phylogenies will always be subject to revision as more discoveries are made, but one thing is certain. When you organize organisms based on shared character traits, a nested hierarchy structure emerges. Now, at this point, it's helpful to know the difference between a monophyletic and paraphyletic group. A monophyletic group is an exclusive group of organisms in the same taxon that all share a most recent common ancestor, and which includes all descendants of that common ancestor. A paraphyletic group describes a group of animals that all share a common ancestor, but which does not include all of that ancestor's descendants. So, for instance, chordate is monophyletic. All chordates share the same chordate ancestor, and no group has independently evolved a notochord, and no chordate has ever lost the notochord. So every descendant of the original chordate ancestor is included in this group. But reptilia is paraphyletic. Mammals, birds, and crocodiles all share a common ancestor, but the characteristics used to describe a reptile do not apply to birds or mammals, so they are paraphyletic. To refer to the group that includes reptiles, birds, and mammals, it would be more proper to use the monophyletic term amniote, as that characteristic encompasses all of its descendants. Usually this problem comes about as a clash between the scientific term for an organism and the common language term. For instance, the term wasp is used to refer to several different organisms throughout the Hymenoptera group, but excludes certain others, like ants and bees. As such, the term wasp is not scientifically helpful. Same goes for fish. I have heard it said that because of cladistics, we are all still fish because you don't outgrow your ancestry. And while it is true that you don't outgrow your ancestry, that doesn't apply to the colloquial term like fish, because the definition of fish necessarily excludes some descendants of organisms that would be our common ancestor with fish. Now that's all well and good, but why is this evidence for evolution? 
Isn't it all based on the assumption of relatedness? Yes, and that's actually part of why it is evidence for evolution. Evolution predicts that different species would be related to each other. A consequence of this prediction is that related species would have characteristics in common, and the closer the relation, the more characteristics are in common. Cats and dogs have more in common with each other than they do with rabbits. Cats, dogs, and rabbits have more in common with each other than they do with armadillos. Cats, dogs, rabbits, and armadillos have more in common with each other than they do with birds. And so it goes. The farther back in time the common ancestor of two extant species, the less those two species will have in common. But if there is no relatedness between different species, if they do not share a common ancestor, then it is reasonable to expect that similarities will show up in populations with no discernible pattern. A cephalopod might have a spinal column, a turtle might have an amniotic egg, an insect might grow an internal skeleton, a mammal might grow feathers, a bird might grow fur, and so on. These characteristics are known as synapomorphies, and it's more than just superficial similarities. After all, a dolphin and a tuna fish share many characteristics superficially, but they are not very closely related. This takes us back to homology. Using the different methods that we have at our disposal, we can determine whether a character we are looking at is similar because of ancestry, or whether it developed all on its own. And when you arrange animals by their shared, derived characters that are determined to be homologous, it ends up looking remarkably like a phylogeny. The phylogenies usually have, at the base of each group, a character that is shared by all of the descendants of the organism that first developed that character, but none of its ancestors. Usually the exact organism is unknown, so the common ancestor will be represented with the name of the character rather than the name of a species. Once a phylogeny is constructed, it needs to be analyzed for accuracy. Because we can't always know for certain if a character is homologous or analogous, there will always be a degree of uncertainty when it comes to placement on the tree. For instance, if we weren't able to trace the embryological development of the wing, and if we didn't know about the underlying bone structure of different wings, then we would have no way of knowing if bat wings and bird wings were homologous or analogous. If we didn't know, then just the fact that they appear to be a shared character would place them close together on a phylogeny, though we do know that bats belong closer to the wingless mammals and birds belong closer to the wingless dinosaurs than to each other. That's where the different methods of assessing the accuracy of the tree come in. There are several different ways of checking phylogenies for accuracy. I touched on the parsimony method earlier. For our bat and bird example, we would examine bats, birds, and a third animal, let's just say another mammal for simplicity's sake. A tree that places bats close to birds would show one character in common, the wings. A tree that places bats with the other mammal shows many more characters in common that don't fit with birds. Fur, mammary glands, live birth, the structure of the ear, and placentas, just to name a few. So the tree that places bats with mammals is more parsimonious than the one that places them with birds. There are also maximum likelihood methods for developing phylogenies, which they will infer rates of evolution directly from the data, and determine the tree that best describes the data given those inferred rates. So maximum likelihood actually develops a tree from raw data that has the highest probability of occurring. There are several other methods, and one important fact here is that, usually, different methods of producing phylogenies that rely on different underlying assumptions will end up agreeing on phylogenies that are highly similar when looked at statistically. But how do we know that these phylogenies are actually accurately representing real relationships? Well, because it's been tested. There have been several instances of researchers breeding mice, bacteriophages, viruses, and plants, keeping track of the actual phylogenetic relationships, and then using the various methods of reconstructing unknown phylogenetic trees, and have found them to be highly accurate. For instance, a bacteriophage was propagated and exposed to a mutagen, and each lineage was tracked. At the end, there were over 135,000 possible phylogenetic trees. They then used five different methods for inferring phylogeny. The person on their team who did the inferential phylogeny was kept in the dark as to what the actual recorded phylogeny was in order to avoid skewing the results with bias. All five methods used produced an accurate phylogeny. And if all that isn't enough, phylogenetic analysis has met the five criteria for admissibility of expert testimony in the United States. Those criteria being that one, it can and has been tested, two, it has been subjected to peer review and publication, three, it has a known error rate, four, there currently exists actively maintained standards controlling its operation, and five, it has the backing of the scientific consensus. There are several cases where phylogenetic analysis has been used as evidence that has resulted in convictions. So just for fun, let's go through a very much oversimplified phylogenetic lineage leading to modern humans. We have nuclei in our cells, so we are eukaryotes. 
Our cells with flagella have one flagellum, so we are unicons. We are multicellular eukaryotes, so we are metazoans. Our bodies have bilateral symmetry, so we are bilaterians. Our embryos have notochords, so we are chordates. We have a sense of smell, so we are part of the olfactores. We have skulls, so are in craniata. We have spines, so are vertebrates. Skipping down past some of the more technical ones, we have jaws, and so are nathostomes. We have bony rather than cartilaginous skeletons, so are osteichthys. Skipping down past even more of the technical ones, we have four limbs, so are tetrapods. At this point, it's necessary to point out that I am getting these images from the Phylogeny Explorer project, which is an incredibly ambitious project that seeks to be a comprehensive map of all known life forms. It is incomplete in some places, and so that's why there are placeholder names for splits that we know happen but haven't necessarily named yet. So that's where unnamed Tetrapod 1 comes in. Take out the unnamed splits, you'll still end up at humans. Our legs are not sprawled out sideways like crocodiles, so we are therapsids. Our teeth are differentiated, so we are cynodonts. We have hair and feed our babies with milk, so we are mammals. We have placentas, so we are placental mammals. Our hind legs are dominant, and we have opposable thumbs, so we are primates. The exterior of our noses are dry, so we are haplorini. Our nostrils point downward, so we are catarini. We are completely bipedal and use tools, so we are homo. I have skipped over many, many divisions in this phylogeny, each with a set of defining characteristics. And for the ones I did show, I gave only brief descriptions of the defining characteristics, where there were often several more. If you want a more comprehensive tracing of our lineage and phylogenetic grouping, I highly recommend Aaron Ra's currently 48 video series called the Systematic Classification of Life. Even in 48 10-ish minute videos, his are still oversimplified. So we fit the descriptions of all of these categories perfectly, and our closest ancestors, chimps and bonobos, fit them all perfectly as well, at least until we get to the split that led to their clade, Pan. Our next closest relatives, gorillas, fit the exact same series of characteristics right up until they diverge at homininae, and so on. The farther back you go, the more relatives can be included in the phylogeny. So at the end of the day, Phylogenies in isolation are not evidence for evolution, but when you combine them with the other methods that we have of determining relationships, they lay out a remarkably accurate map of relationships among all life on Earth, and they have been regularly put to the test to ensure that they aren't just coincidentally matching up. The theory of evolution is the best explanation as to why life appears to be related. Thanks, as always, to my patrons who make this series possible. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so for as little as a dollar per episode at patreon.com slash vice rhino. You can also follow me on Twitter at vice rhino, and a link to my Facebook page as well as my P.O. Box address are in the description. See you next time! Hamanin and Hamanin and A. Hamanin and A. Hamana, 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 Hamanin and A. Hamanin and A. Hamanin and A. Hamanin and A. No, there are too many ends. Hamanin and A. 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 This is a fun word. That needs practice. Oh, where was I? Our next closest relatives, gorillas, 